All right, good morning, everyone. Let's get uh, started. So, so this is a, this is our patient, 39-year-old male, who presented to the McDill Clinic, and this is back in the day. This is 1992 when Dr. Harrison used to work at the McDill Clinic, and so he came there after an episode of severe shortness of breath and palpitations during exercise. The, the patient was in the army, so he was an avid runner. So this was unusual for him because he was out running and he had to stop to catch his breath. He felt that his heart was pounding and it was just racing really hard. And the patient was seen right there by a physician and he was given some medications and told that he should follow up at the clinic to get an in-depth evaluation. Um, at the clinic, the patient was not in acutely in any kind of discomfort. He didn't have any symptoms at that time. He denied any prior episodes of such uh, an event. He did say he had a functional murmur that was identified on his physical just when he was uh, being recruited in the army. Um, patient also denied any kind of chest pain, any swelling, any orthopnea, fever chills, any illnesses, dizziness, lightheadedness, syncope falls, or change in appetite or weight loss. For his history, as I mentioned, he was aware that he had a functional heart murmur. He also had this uh, kind of severe chest trauma during a football game um, as a teenager. That's the only thing he could recollect, no other kind of uh, problems. His surgical history was a tonsillectomy. His father died at the age of 57 from a cardiomyopathy, and he also had some mitral valve disease. His mom had a history of atrial fibrillation and um, allergies with penicillin, he gets hives. He wasn't on any medications at that time. In his social history, non-smoker, not no alcohol or drugs. For his physical, basically vitals were stable, no problem there. General, he was not in any acute distress. He seemed to have an irregular rate and rhythm. For his cardiovascular exam, and there was a hollow systolic murmur heard at the left sternal border. And um, besides that, everything else was unremarkable. His EKG at that time, if you look at this EKG, it seems to, that he has low voltage, both anterior and precordial leads. Other than that, if you look at lead two at the bottom, uh, you can see that the rhythm is um, not uh, regular. So this actually looks like a patient who has AFib. I uh, wonder why the voltage is low, but um, that's what you can make out from the EKG. Um, he also had an echo at that time. The echo actually showed that he had very severe tricuspid regurge along with the AFib that was added on to it, so it was actually very severe tricuspid regurge. Uh, but all the other valves at that time were normal. He had enlargement of the right atrium and the right ventricle. The left side chambers were all normal in size. There was no other wall motion abnormalities. His uh, 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 our right ventricular systolic pressure was normal, and the LV ejection fraction was also normal. Uh, so that made us kind of uh, go into what are causes of having like an isolated TR or a primary TR. And um, so when you think of the causes, you think of a direct valve injury, maybe because of a permanent pacemaker that was placed or an ICD lead placement or a removal of the ICD lead or an endomyocardial biopsy that the patient might have had for some reason. Um, other reasons can be infective endocarditis or an Epstein anomaly, a congenital problem, or you can have rheumatic fever, a carcinoid syndrome. Ischemic heart disease can also do that. Maybe you can damage your papillary muscle or some other apparatus in there. Um, chest trauma, connective tissue disorder like Marfan's, or you can have it in association with like a mitral valve prolapse, or you can have myxomatous degeneration that can end up leading to a tricuspid valve prolapse. Or it could be a result of drug-induced with the use of appetite suppressant, and the, uh, and the reason there is that they have some serotonin like uh, um, activity, and that kind of feeds into the carcinoid um, syndrome type picture. So the plan with him was, was he had this isolated TR. It was still unclear what the etiology was. He didn't have any of these 
any, any of these ideologies, I mean, that really pointed out to what was really going on. Um, he did have the AFib, and so he needed some rate control. He was put on, I think, uh, uh, maybe, I think it was uh, Diltiazem. And because of his uh, echo, he was also recommended that he get a repair of his tricuspid valve. So the patient underwent tricuspid valve repair in 1993, had an aneuplasty ring. This was done at the Lackland Air Force Base. Um, he tolerated the procedure well. Over the years, his condition actually improved, but then he started to get recurrent TR, which was severe, and this was again, had still had the AFib, which seemed to be chronic. Um, he at some point he also reported that he could not lie down flat at night because of a very rapid heart rate and he would start to get palpitations and he was also short of breath. <clears throat> um, so a patient was being followed up and he was getting echoes and the echoes still showed severe TR, enlargement of the right chambers, normal contractility and he also developed this bundle branch block. He also long um, at some time also got a cath which showed that his arteries were normal. So this kind of helps rule out ischemic heart disease as being a cause of why he had this um, isolated tricuspid regurg. So patient, because of his severe picture, he underwent, he was recommended replacement. That's what he ended up getting in 2007. And at the same time, uh, he underwent a maze surgical ablation of his atrial fibrillation. This was done by Dr. Chitwood at East Tennessee State University. Um, and he ended up having a complicated uh, hospital course because he ended up getting a pneumonia um, right after. And when he was released, apparently he ended up developing a clot along the ablation line. And this led to a PE, which eventually resolved. So it was kind of strange why he just ended up getting a clot all of a sudden around the ablation line. So there were a lot of questions just uh, rising from this. And um, overall, though, the surgery was, su was successful. The patient did say his condition improved significantly thereafter. He was then undergoing routine follow-up. And so that included repeat echoes. So his first one right after the surgery showed he didn't have any tricuspid regurge. The chambers were still big. The LV contractility was normal. The ejection fraction was normal. And his right ventricular systolic pressure was also back down to 18. He did have a hypercoagulability workup just to see why he was developed this clot. And he ended up, uh, we ended up finding out that he had protein C and S deficiency and he was put on Coumadin. And this is probably what uh, also promoted his uh, formation of the clot. And uh, then he had another echo in 2009. Now you can see here that left atrium is also started to get enlarged. The contractility of the normal left ventricle is normal. Ejection fraction is normal. The RVSP is 20. So moving on, he kept getting echoes kind of annually just to make sure we we're following him. He started to have this TR come back again um, his mitral valve, there was also some insufficiency of the mitral valve that was developing. And um, the right chambers were big. Also, you can see again, the left atrium is also big. He, there was some LVH. I think there was some borderline LVH. Ejection fraction was okay. The RVSP, as you can see, is continues to go up. Now it's 29. The echo next year, again, you have the tricuspid regurgs, the mitral regurgs. There was some pulmonary insufficiency. This is trace. I don't know how significant this really is. Uh, the chambers now, you can see all four chambers of the heart are now dilated. The contractility of the heart, at least the left ventricle, is normal. Again, some borderline LVH. Ejection fraction is okay. And the RVSP continues to go up. Along this time, he also had an... Uh, MRI and the MRI was actually different in the sense that it didn't show any significant tricuspid regurgitation. only some that was seen in diastole. Um, right ventricle was contracting fine. The LV ejection fraction was, was also good. Um, there was some dilated ventricles on the right side. 
no damage to the heart, so no delayed enhancement, and there was no coronary anomalies, no congenital defects. This is also important because this also helps us rule out having any kind of congenital disease or having any other um, problems with the heart as being the cause of why he has this isolated tricuspid regurgitation. Again, moving on with the echoes, you can see the mitral regurgitation is still there. Um, the uh, chambers are still dilated. Ejection fraction normal, but the RVSP continues to rise. It was 36, or it's actually a lot similar to what it was last year, the previous year. Uh, again, more echoes. And in this one, you can actually see the RVSP kind of jumped up. Otherwise, everything else seems like it's not changed. Um, the one in 2014 also showed it went up even further. The atrial pressure was also 20, and there was some moderately dilated inferior vena cava, which was also seen. That and so you can see there's some kind of uh, congestive picture that's going on here. Uh, in 2015, um, you still have the mitral regurgitation, the tri tricuspid regurgitation. The RVSP didn't seem like it went up. It actually just went down maybe a little bit, or maybe you can say it stayed about the same. And uh, everything else sort of didn't change much. The right atrial pressure this time was only 10. Chambers are still dilated. Um, so then he came back in follow-up uh, just recently, and... He reported having some occasional bilateral pedal edema for the past few months. He denies any other kind of symptoms, no chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, dizziness, not, nothing really going on with him besides that. So we ended up doing a repeat echo on him to see how he's doing now. And we have images of that to show you, so just hold on for a second. Okay, so uh, here's our echocardiogram. Luke, you want to make any comments on our echo? Well, continuing right along, basically, uh, we see normal left ventricular contractility. Left ventricular size looks okay. There's some mitral regurgitation, which is this little green flash that we're seeing back in here. Green flash back in here. Tricuspid regurgitation is over on this side of the interventricular septum. See it coming up there? It's a wall hugger. Contractility is normal as we stream along here. And there's our mitral regurgitation, and there's our tricuspid valve. And as you see here, there's no Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly, the uh, tricuspid valve would be slipped sort of downward into uh, more like uh, a much smaller right atrial area. And... Uh, there would be a different position, and there would be atrialization of some of the right ventricle. And so, uh, and the right atrium would look larger, but it's actually atrialization of a part of the right ventricle. And so there you can see some uh, evidence of uh, the previous uh, prosthetic tricuspid valve. It looks like a bioprosthesis of some sort. You can see the, the uh, struts sticking up there, at least two of them. And you can see a little bit of the TR coming out there. So I think that gets a, a pretty good survey of this particular echo. Left atrial size enlarged a little bit at uh, 58. That's more than a little bit. And so uh, let me get you the other echo. So in this echocardiogram, you can see the enlarged right ventricle. You can see uh, that the right ventricle controls some of the heart, and this is a common wall between them, which is the interventricular septum. If the right ventricle gets large, and if there's problems with the right side, then that becomes problems with the interventricular septum, which uh, is uh, now owned by the right ventricle instead of the left ventricle. You can get abnormal septal motion because of... Uh, volume overload, and the interventricular septum actually becomes uh, more of a right ventricular wall. And so uh, being part of the left ventricle, that means left ventricular dysfunction. It can lead to greater left ventricular dysfunction, distortion, 
distortion of the anterior lateral papillary muscle, uh, perhaps some microgurgitation, and of course, as you know, cardiac muscle is a syncytium. So if anything happens to one part of the muscle, it's involving the rest of the muscle because they're all interrelated as a syncytium. So there we're starting to see some uh, microgurgitation there. We'll get back to that. Here's the uh, prosthetic valve. There's some prosthetic valve leakage and coming along there. Hard to quantify. There's no inflow abnormality. Left atrium again is enlarged. The interatrial septum is uh, controlled by the right ventricle in this case because the right atrium is so large that it impinges on the left atrium in some ways. You can see the mitral regurgitation. Uh, it looks like a broad jet at the base. So new complication in this gentleman may be related to the anterior lateral papillary muscle. Maybe partly the myocardial factor involved in right-sided pathology influencing the syncytial muscle uh, that connects into the left ventricle from the right ventricle. Certainly we've all seen patients in the past with mitral stenosis who have a pure stenotic lesion who get uh, some myocardial dysfunction of the left ventricle even though the left ventricle is protected by having less volume from mitral stenosis there's still a myocardial factor that seems to be influenced by the right ventricle in that it's a syncytial muscle so uh, and then the RV systolic pressure being elevated we've got a measurement of that somewhere here there it goes there you go RV systolic pressure, 58.7. Okay. All right, so we're back at the presentation. So the echo, as Dr. Harrison already mentioned, showed the moderate to severe MR, some tricuspid regress, despite having the tricuspid valve replaced, aortic sclerosis, but not any stenosis, enlarged chambers, um, borderline LVH, Ejection fraction normal, RVSP was elevated. I think probably this is the highest number it has. Uh, there was subtle flattening during diastole, which was also consistent with some right ventricular volume overload. <clears throat> and so coming from this, the next thing was, what is the plan for this patient and what is the reason? So if you look at all the studies that were done and uh, so on on this patient, it seems like there's not really a clear ideology uh, for him, the only thing that we could think of was uh, just looking at simply, it's like uh, just excluding everything else. The only thing that was left was his severe chest trauma, which when we talked to him, he simply said that he was, uh, um, had, I mean, playing a football game and he was hit really, really hard and they just kind of knocked him out. And that was kind of the only event he had at the age of 14, even before he entered the army and our um, basically what we think happened is that over time uh, that trauma whatever damage it did it kind of uh, progressed to eventually lead to this isolated tricuspid regurge and then uh, that's what's initiated everything so even uh, with the change in uh, chamber sizes um, basically a heart is a syncytium so if you have uh, changes on one side of the heart, you're probably going to have some changes also start to reflect over time on the other side. So initially you saw the changes in the chambers on the right side, and I think over time the entire heart started to get remodeled differently, and the left side also started to get dilated, and that may have contributed to problems on the left side with uh, in terms of the mitral valve, and then the whole congestive picture going back also giving rise to the uh, elevated RVSP and uh, and so forth. So the good thing was patient when he came was asymptomatic. He didn't have any problems. So even though his numbers might have looked a little bit bad, he, he was completely asymptomatic. So what we decided to do for him was 
we're going to repeat his MRI and correlate the findings with the, with the echoes that he's had. And then based on that, we'll get a better idea of where he stands, where his valves stand, where his heart stand, and then we'll see on how to do, how to proceed with him. Um, he is on Lasix at the moment. Also, his uh, pedal edema, we sent him to a vein specialist, and it turns out that he has chronic uh, insufficiency, and he ended up getting some ablation on uh, both of his legs for that. And he continues to follow up with the vein specialist. And um, other than that, he's doing good. Any questions for this part? So let's take a minute to talk a little bit about uh, traumatic tricuspid regurgitation. We do have a second case, so don't run away. Uh, and so traumatic tricuspid regurgitation is something no one ever considers. We do have some people who uh, are nonogenarians that have shown up here with Epstein's. And uh, so we're used to seeing a few Epstein's hanging around that uh, survive into their 80s and 90s. And so we always have a couple of those around. We, use, we pick up a carcinoid every five or ten years. Joe Carver presented one recently for our cardio-oncology conference, and so we pick up a few of those. The FenFen epidemic is over. Heidi Connolly from Mayo Clinic followed that very rigorously, and so did a lot of attorneys, and so they had they set up screening in hotels and had mass screenings of people that had taken FenFen, and uh, there were cardiologists that were doing uh, couple hundred echoes a day in several different hotel rooms and reading them that were called into question for you know the quality control and their ability to be able to do that reasonably uh, so that's the fen fen story we have a few fen fens around and then the traumatic thing is the diagnosis by exclusion we don't find anything else and uh, so then we start asking about trauma and you find out about the airbag explosion or the patient getting kicked by a cow or the officer who was exposed to a grenade explosion or, or uh, improvised uh, explosive device. And so uh, lots of reasons for people to get trauma in their lifetime. But what's really interesting is it's not post hoke ergo propter hoke that you had uh, trauma and then all of a sudden you've got this problem. It's uh, There's a long span of time between when you have the trauma and when the tricuspid regurgitation results in symptoms and you become, the medical system becomes aware of you. And so that's the whole thing is that long time period. So being in a big heart center for a long time, we had a lot of patients coming in and you sift through them and you find some isolated tricuspid regurgitation occasionally and then you go into history and you find history of some trauma and then you collect those cases over the years and I guess we collected about eight or nine, we repaired them, or we replaced them, and then we followed them, and they seem to improve a little bit, maybe uh, a class, so they go from clinical class four to two and a half, or clinical class three to two. Wasn't a dramatic improvement, wasn't a total improvement, but there was some improvement that was uh, demonstrable, and so then you write that up as a group of cases, and then I get a call from uh, Dr. Hurst that we were invited to contribute to Dr. Willis Hurst's uh, textbook at the time on the heart, and uh, they were doing an update, and they wanted tricuspid regurgitation. You scan the literature, and there was only one report of several cases of tricuspid regurgitation from trauma, and that was our group at Tampa General with Dr. Spar. And so well, then we did write that up, and at the same time collect cases from around the world. And so as Dr. Tariq discovered, uh, there are cases that are mostly isolated case reports and so then you find one in the German literature and you find a couple in Maladie de Cour in France. And so you translate those. And so we had Dr. Nord translate the German literature for us. And we put it all together and had maybe 25 cases or so that we uh, published uh, as a chapter of the book Heart uh, just to talk about something somewhat obscure, which is traumatic tracheal regurgitation. The reason is that no one ever thinks of it. And so it turned out that the trend was it took uh, a long time before it became clinically obvious, uh, up to, you know, 15, 20, 25 years. And so that was interesting because then we could think about uh, those patients that have the most tricuspid regurgitation 
uh, the most often that we were able to see, and that was this endocarditis group that had uh, acute or subacute endocarditis. And so uh, those are the drug users and the people that uh, were being written up at Henry Ford Hospital. So the guys at Henry Ford sent you to put a new valve in. Uh, they would come back infected again uh, time and time again. So they said, hey, why don't we just uh, forget the tricuspid valve? Let's just toss it. Who needs a tricuspid valve? And so they did toss them and say, we'll just leave valve free, and they'll do fine. And uh, there was a, Dr. Shabatai ran a group of dogs uh, that were uh, basically valve free. And it wasn't until later that they started having problems. And so the same thing they discovered in Henry Ford, oh, maybe you do need a tricuspid valve, but it just takes a long time before you discover that uh, this pathology results in pathophysiology. And so they follow them, and in a long period of time, they start getting tricuspid regurgitation. They do need a valve. And so that's the story of uh, tra traumatic tricuspid regurgitation. But let's talk about our next case and just hold it for a minute. We'll get our slides up. All righty. Uh, brought to you by Smart Dog Productions, namely Beaumont, our resident uh, mascot here. And this is the case of the grainy CCTA. And so here's our champion, uh, Sherlock Holmes, examining this awful-looking CT scan that's rated as a CAD-RADS ND. ND meaning non-diagnostic. And so you say, well, that's too bad. You know, how'd you get to that? Why did you do this guy? You know, was he too big and didn't you use enough KV, like 140 instead of 120? And why don't you use more contrast, like 100 cc's instead of 65 cc's? You know, how could you get such a crummy study, and why'd you do it? So let's talk about that. How did we get there? So here's our guy, 55-year-old guy sent by a rheumatologist that does some internal medicine to, referred by his wife, who's a patient here, as well as the doctor. And he had some ST and T-wave changes, but the old positive family history seems to get everyone here at some time. And that's when you have a father that has a heart attack, and you become the same age, usually, uh, at, at the anniversary of your father's heart attack, somehow it sort of sinks in uh, to your Neanderthal Bay brain in terms of medical treatment and something might be wrong with you, which you really don't like to think about. Uh, especially males don't think much about that. And it sinks in that maybe I ought to go see a doctor since my father had a heart attack at this age. So this was the case of the father having a heart attack at age 40 and then uh, another heart attack at 61 and dying and then a brother with stents at 41. So this gentleman uh, was markedly obese and lost 115 pounds in a period of a year, has a known hypertension, had a TIA in the past, still smoking a little bit, history of some mental depression, sees a psychiatrist for those on medications, and then an echocardiogram that showed severe left ventricular hypertrophy. And so we said, what are we going to do with this guy? We did the echo, and we'll show you that. Uh, a couple pieces of the echo, and so you're, you've got a guy that that's uh, pretty big that you know you're not going to be able to get a good CT scan, probably won't fit in the into the camera for the MRI, and so you don't know what you're going to do, so you say, well, let's do a PET, and PET, you know, they pay for that if your body, if your BSA is, uh, BMI is greater than 40, they pay for that, and so that's a good thing, and so... Um, but they will deny it the rest of the time, even though it's a better study than spec scanning. At least uh, a lot of denials. Actually, it's the same cost now as spec scanning, so it really doesn't matter the denial, but they they haven't learned that it's the same cost and a better test. Insurance companies are very difficult uh, because they're managed from the top down. And so so we said, hey, let's get a Lexscan C PET CT. You know, this is the perfect guy for that. We'll get good blood flow, and it doesn't matter about his size because we're using a PET isotope that's 511 KEV, and uh, so we get good, good penetration. So here is uh, the strain echo that we rely on, which is 4D strain. It's markedly abnormal. Why is it markedly abnormal? Well, I think it's markedly abnormal because this patient has severe LVH. So here's 18 and 18. So I suspect it's the LVH that makes this markedly abnormal. I don't suspect it's a manifestation of coronary artery disease, but you got to remember LVH makes a lot of things abnormal, and we're going to look and see what else might be abnormal because of the LVH. Certainly, it creates increased uh, resistance. Certainly, we have uh, less blood vessels available for the subendocardium. You have to rely on the thebesians and the distal blood vessels, and so there's some microvascular dysfunction, 
and increased resistance because of the increased vascular bed. And so if you're calculating FFR, myocardial mass is extremely important. And when HeartFlow does the FFR on the CT scan, they use the myocardial mass directly from that patient from the, from the CT. And they have to have that data to accurately figure the FFR. So let's see what we found. Well, this is a, the only place you'll ever see this display of a PET scan that looks like this. It's a signature of Dr. Lance Gould. Well, who's Dr. Lance Gould? What's well, K. Lance Gould? And he's only the father of coronary blood flow. I mean, somebody had to figure out that you have to have an 85% stenosis to have reduction of blood flow in patients with coronary artery disease, and that was Dr. Gould. And Dr. Gould continues to echo FFR, coronary flow reserve, uh, and uh, the usefulness of PET scan. It was part of the Arnie study years ago when they were looking for reversal of coronary artery disease, and people would fly by American Airlines from Dean Ornish in Sausalito, California, to Houston, Texas to get their scan. Well, people are still flying to Houston, Texas to get their scan. Why is that? Well, he's the best uh, in the world. And so he, had, he has developed this software from you pumping gas into your car because this is $100 million of uh, development with 43 years of development time to make the software. Uh, and basically, it's Houston oil money that paid for that, not national grants. And so he is self-endowed in a self-endowed weatherhead center uh, where uh, he is able to conduct this research outside of the establishment and has published very, very sophisticated papers with Niles Johnson, his associate. And so let's look at this and see what we can tell about this because it is a different format from what you usually see. The isotope was rubidium. That's rubidium-82. And so it should be some pretty nice pictures with rubidium. The half-life is 72 seconds. And so you get your pictures, even though it's a very hot isotope with 511 KeV, uh, it doesn't last long. There are 72 seconds. So the x-ray exposure of this test is about 3 millisieverts, uh, which is pretty good compared with thallium scanning, which is like 22 millisieverts, or technetium scanning, which is you know 18 millisieverts. That's pretty good exposure. 3.5, 3 millisieverts of radiation to get the study. So we look here and we look at, oh, orange is normal. So we look for orange and we got some lemon and uh, we got some lime. And so that means that at rest, this should be all orange. And so the perfusion at rest is not normal. Reason to be decided. Okay, so then we perfuse him with uh, regadenosine because he's an asthmatic. So regadenosine was used rather than presentin. Regadenosine has a, a quick peak and plateau and then drops off quickly. But uh, the timing uh, of Dr. Gould's rubidium is superb and the acquisition is superb. And we're able to get good studies and I've done, you know, 1,000, 4,000 of them with regadenosine. So regadenosine uh, gives you great pictures. So look at this. Well, we got more orange. We've got less lemon and uh, almost uh, no lime. And that little blue thing doesn't make any difference. And so it looks like, it looks like we get better flow. We get better flow. So uh, better heart. Well, we also have better ejection fraction. So the ejection fraction at rest was 58%, and it's increased to 64%. That's a normal response. Uh, if it decreases by 12%, that's main left or three vessel coronary artery disease. So that's a good thing. And then we go over here, and we got a lot of lemon and a lot of lime, and we don't have a lot of orange. And this is actually coronary flow reserve. It's the same thing we have up here. It's myocardial perfusion capacity overall is reduced for some reason. So what's going on with that? Well, let's, let's think about it. And so let's go down here. And this is a new pattern that Dr. Gould is showing us. I've been looking at these things for a long time. And uh, he's always had these three patterns. And this is the first time that he's taken the third pattern and uh, put it next to a fourth pattern. And the fourth pattern is color-coded differently, and this is FFR. So he's moved into the land of PET FFR instead of coronary flow reserve. He's got fractional flow reserve because that's the name of the game from FAME 1 and FAME 2. So when we look at that, uh, we can uh, say there is some decreased FFR, and we know the FFR is less than 80 is called significant. 
Well, there's a shadow zone, probably a gray zone. 0.73, maybe 0.76 is in that gray zone. And so, but we do have clearly, we've got some of the tan and some of the brown, which we're getting at 0 0.60, 0 0.50. So, and that seems to be distributed around the posterior descending in the inferior wall and also sort of nicely distributed along the diagonal side, not the septal perforator side, but the diagonal side of the LAD. And then over here, uh, there's some distribution uh, further over. This is the LAD. This is the septal side. And there's some further distribution over in this direction. And so it looks like uh, the FFR would be reduced in uh, the posterior descending, the left anterior descending. And so, so now we've got a problem according to Dr. Gould's study here. And the problem we have with Dr. Gould's study is we've got decreased blood flow sort of at rest diffusely and then normal, but no evidence of a segmental perfusion defect. So the LED, there's no blue area there. There are the inferior wall, there's no blue area there. And so we don't have ischemia, yet we have sort of reduced FFR. So he's in a quandary about this and doesn't know what to do. So Dr. Gould never, never, never says do a cardiac cath. And he said, do a cardiac cath and measure some FFRs. So I think he's become a slave to the FFR, which, every, which only 6% of us have because that's all they're doing in the cardiac cath lab. And so perhaps the insurance company will make us slaves to the FFR. So let's look and see what did we do? Well, we're not going to do a cath because Dr. Harrison's not going to do a cath, even though Dr. Gould, contrary to his nature, is saying do a cath. Let's see what we're going to do. And he says, need cardiac cath to explain this discrepancy of no focal ischemia but decreased FFR. So is it a three-vessel disease? Is it main left disease? And he also saw some calcification. He saw some calcification, he said, in the LAD. Uh, we'll talk about that. And some calcification in the circumflex. Hmm. I don't think I saw that, but let's take a look and see uh, what we're going to try to figure out for Dr. Gould because we will do a meeting with Dr. Gould and we'll go online and we'll try to reconcile this. So, of course, we're going to do a CT even though this guy is overweight and uh, he's going to be very difficult to visualize. We'll have to use a 140 KEV. we have to use 100 cc's of contrast. So let's go look and see what did that look like. And Sherlock Holmes, the game is afoot. And so 285 pounds after losing 115 pounds, he's still a big boy. 5'7", if he was 6'3", 6'4", he'd be a lot better, stretched out. So look at this study. This is a horrible study. This is why we didn't do it in the first place. This is why we sent the patient to Dr. Gould. And so this is grainy. I hate it. I hate to show it as our study. Here, they can't even see that. There's a misregistration. We're trying to look at uh, the distal circumflex here. You know, it's horrible. This is the best I can do. Actually, I've covered up a little bit so you can't see it by color coding. So you can't see that the column of dye is so faint in comparison to the myocardium. So we don't have a good differentiation between, uh, uh, I guess, uh, vascular items uh, and myocardial muscle. There's not a good differential here. And so, look. Look at this pale vessel. It's almost lost in here. I'm ashamed to say this is one of our studies. But we were forced into this. Let's see if we can salvage anything by this. And so again, you know, look over here. Just very poor differentiation from the myocardial tissue of the coronary arteries with contrast. Just sort of lost in this mass of uh, this patient. And over here we can see the same thing. We're looking at the LED. We're looking here at a ramus, and so so very poor differentiation, grainy, hazy description of these vessels. So let's see where that takes us. And the grainy, and hypoplastic right, dominant left circulation, LAD. Let's see what we find. Well, look what we find on the LAD. We've got one focal. LAD, coronary calcification with positive remodeling 
and very, very focal, not linear, without obstruction in the vessel. And so does this mean anything to us? Uh, and let's look over here. Here it is, right here. That definitely has been positively remodeled. That was made a long time ago. There was a vulnerable plaque. You paved over it, covered it up, and then pushed it out, neutralized it, and kept the chamber open, the channel open. And so that was in a very effective way of dealing with uh, perhaps what you might call a little pimple inside the vessel that can uh, create havoc by rupturing. So uh, let's see what else we can find. Well, we can look around here and we can see, wow, this is a really nice homogeneous image. Uh, and that's really very clear that this is the only piece of calcium in any of these coronaries. So single, sort of one and done, very focal, positive remodeled coronary calcification, and really very nice images in that they're homogeneous. They may be grainy, but they're homogeneous. Maybe this isn't a non-diagnostic study after all. Let's look and see a little more detail of the distribution of the contrast in the myocardium. So this is taking calcium scoring software that's meant for a totally different purpose and looking at the myocardium and looking at the iodine in the myocardium and looking for the distribution. It's a little confluent here. Iodine is sort of randomly distributed around here. A little less right there because beam hardening artifacts usually come off of uh, the uh, sternum. And as we come around here, you know, it looks pretty good. And then back in here, you can get some beam hardening artifacts there uh, and some uh, what's called photon starvation uh, coming off from uh, the spine and from the inferior and from uh, the distal aorta, and so which is the abdominal aorta. And so this is really a nice, pretty homogeneous distribution of uh, of contrast throughout this myocardium, which means a good that's a good thing. And so let's look and see if we were going to put this on a polar map, what would this look like? And so this is our polar map of the distribution of iodine in the heart. And so you can see, wow, that's pretty homogeneous distribution on the polar map. Looks very nice. And so these are just little ditzels that don't mean anything. So nice polar map. Is there anything we can make out of this? Well, this is either equal ischemia and severe multivessel coronary artery disease or it's uh, no coronary artery disease at all and uh, basically good perfusion. So let's look and see further what we can make out of this if, we're, if we were Watson, which uh, Watson is our supercomputer we're going to be using soon to try to make points and find points of correlation that we couldn't find before because we never thought of them. So here's a CT scan that's non-diagnostic because of the body size, but there's only one focal calcific non-obstructive positive remodeled plaque in the LAD, which in my experience, I'm not Watson, but in my experience is never accompanied by vulnerable plaque with necrotic core. What we see with vulnerable plaque with necrotic core is we see sort of linear calcifications without positive remodeling are with positive remodeling but not clearing the channel and still being present in the channel as well. And so that is a sort of uh, hallmark of one and done where the course of your lifetime you may have a perfect storm and you get uh, a little area of inflammation. You might get a little nodule of necrotic core, a little blister or bleb inside a vessel and you react to it you lay down uh, calcium, calcify it, and push it out, and that's it, one and done. And so we also see normal CT MPI, which either means normal coronaries or severe multivessel coronary disease. Well, severe multivessel coronary disease does not have one focal calcific plaque with positive remodeling. There would have to be multivessel linear calcifications, which we don't see. Therefore, this is a normal study and this patient is one and done, one of our one and done patients. And so we can say, hey, you know, this is okay. Very clever, my dear Watson, elementary homes. And so if we look at that and think about this, let's go back to Dr. Gould's studies and see if we can reconcile this data with the data he had 
that he was trying to force us into doing cardiac cath on the patient. And so looking at this data, is this data consistent with left ventricular hypertrophy with a very thick heart muscle? Well, yeah, because we get low perfusion, and then we challenge it, and we get better blood flow, and we get better perfusion. There's no ischemic zone, but there's decreased perfusion concentrically and not segmentally, but all over diffusely. And then there's something in terms of decreased FFR that's a commonality in a couple areas. Which areas are those? Well, it's the inferior and, uh, and uh, some uh, which there's not a, a right coronary. This is not the way this patient looks because the posterior descending is coming off the circumflex. So it's the distribution of the left anterior descending and the circumflex with a hypoplastic right. And so that's sort of diffusely distributed, and that means we're talking about left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is a factor of LVH, and uh, the FFR in this case is reduced because of LVH. And there's no uh, actual uh, area of specific decreased relative counts in this patient indicating a stenotic lesion. So we're home free, and uh, the CT did validate the findings, and the, uh, the uh, strain echo also validates the findings of left ventricular hypertrophy. So we're going to review this with Dr. Gould. So this was just showing how we can deal with coronary anatomy when we can't see the coronary blood flow and we don't have good pictures and we can still deal with calcification patterns and we can still deal with uh, blood flow patterns or iodine distribution patterns to make some decisions and this is what we're expecting uh, when we start using a supercomputer and getting new correlates that we've never seen before or never considered before which we've done in this case. So this is a Watson-like case, not a Sherlock Holmes-like case. So thank you very much for attending. We look forward to seeing you next week, and uh, have a good week and weekend. Bye-bye.